<laughs> okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I am really delighted to introduce you all Julia Hockenmeyer. She is in computer science, University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. She's an associate professor there. Um, she started her life, her academic life in Stuttgart, did her uh, PhD work in Edinburgh, uh, did postdoc work with, at the uh, University of Pennsylvania with uh, Irvin Joshi, a uh, computational linguist, uh, before she moved to uh, Illinois. And um, I have known her for more than a decade, 12 or 15 years or something, because I collaborated with her when she was working with Joshi. We had this crazy idea, and she was the one that was designated to implement it. And the crazy idea was, could you take the computer methods that people use to interpret sentences and learn anything about how proteins fold up? Well, that was two totally weird, different worlds, completely opposite ends of the planetary spectrum of science. But Julia was absolutely fearless, and she was also absolutely successful and published a couple of great papers from it. Um, in any case, I am delighted to introduce her and have her here today. Julia, it's all yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. It's really wonderful to be here. Uh, I had a lot of really, really fun conversations this morning, and I'm looking forward to more of that this afternoon. So, uh, my talk is a bit, sorry, so the title of my talk is a bit grand, right? Getting computers to understand natural language, right? Of course, there's a whole field of people that work on that. So I'm just going to give you my own personal you know, perspective on that, based on you know, sort of a few different types of works that we've done over the last few years. And I think one thing that's really important to keep in mind, right, especially, say, as an outsider who doesn't, you know, who's never thought about this problem, is that natural language understanding or generation is deceptively easy, right? Because as, you know, we as humans, right, uh, it, um, and so if we know a language, right, but we cannot not understand it, right? It's just impossible, right? And, and that really means that we, that we sort of, we aren't even aware of all the challenges and all the difficulties and all the ambiguities that exist in natural language. And so I always find it useful to just sort of start with some, some example from a language that like, people don't, don't know. And this is actually a site I've been using since I was a postdoc, right? Um, I mean, like nowadays, of course, we have so many, many people here in the room who speak Chinese and read Chinese. So for you, of course, you know, I should perhaps, I don't know, switch to Hebrew or something, some other language. Um, but, but I mean, and basically, um, if you don't understand the language, right, it's all just, you know, sort of a bunch of symbols, right? And so the traditional view of language understanding, right, I mean, I'm sort of simplifying is that. So the idea is that you need to start off by, by trying to understand what the words are, right? And what do these symbols mean? For example, what do they mean? Um, and then perhaps you want to try to figure out how the words fit together, say in a particular sentence, and it would be syntax. Um, and, then, and then from that you want to go what's called compositional semantics, right? Which basically tells you what's the meaning of each sentence, right? And then of course, once you know, know what each sentence means, you then have to understand what it means in the context of other sentences and so on, right? But that's sort of the basic idea, sort of, sort of this basic pipeline, right? So, so, when, so my research goal is, is to develop systems that understand language. Um, and I've looked at this in a bunch of different ways over the years. When I started out, I really, and again, this is again a slide that, that Ken must still remember from my postdoc days. Um, so um, uh, to me, developing systems that understand language, right, uh, one way to get at that is to basically develop systems that can parse natural language or they can do sort of sentence diagramming. Right? They can sort of uh, understand the grammatical structure of sentences. Right, so that's so that in itself is not really language understanding, but it's clearly a prerequisite for language understanding. Right. And then when I thought about it some more, and, and, and it sort of became clear that that's not quite sufficient. Right, there's sort of other ways of looking at what language understanding means. Right, that go way beyond that. So let's say, so, and, and so um, and actually, I started out in my PhD. We were looking at newspaper texts. Right, so we really tried to to parse these complicated long sentences from many of the Wall Street Journal, right? But then like, I thought, well, actually, there's also some sort of really simple sentences, right? So like, people are shopping in a supermarket, right? What does that mean? And how do you know whether you, whether you or whether a system knows what that means, right? Well, there's certain kinds of inferences that we, that we can draw from that, right? We know that there's a bunch of things that aren't true for those people in that situation, 
And there's a whole bunch of things that we know are true, and that we can interpret. Right? This is just actually sort of common sense knowledge also, right? The, so there's a lot of sort of sort of world knowledge that comes into play when we um, when we understand language. Okay. Because a lot of uh, of the meaning of language isn't necessarily expressed explicitly, right? I mean, like if you, you know, so if you hear a simple sentence like people are shopping in a supermarket, you basically build this whole sort of mental image. Right? And that's how literature works and so on, right? But it's a really fundamental part of language understanding. Right? So understanding language basically also means uh, to be able to draw certain kinds of inferences, right? Between sort of logical or, or common sense. Right? Um, Another way to look at that same problem is to say, well, can we actually connect language to the world? Right? Right? So can we say, well, so here are a set of images um, that are described by the sentence, and here are a bunch of, of images that are not described by, this, by the sentence. Right? So, so understanding language can also mean being able to connect or ground language to the external world. Right? And, um, and one way just sort of study that computationally is, by, um, is basically by trying to connect, say, the text with images. Okay. Um, another way to think about <coughs> language understanding right, is in the task sort of, or in the context of dialogue. Right? A lot of language really is about people talking to each other. Right? It's not just about and the same newspaper text or simple sentences. It's also really people talking to each other, perhaps achieving something by talking to each other. Right. So here's a little game that we developed. So this is within Minecraft. So, so you have two players. You have an architect and a builder. Right? And the architect is shown this picture of the structure and has to tell the builder what to build. Right? Um, and here's some, you know, sort of a screenshot of like an actual conversation between people. Right? So OK, this one looks vaguely like a giraffe. Well, if you squint a little, right, it's two-dimensional. We're going to need two legs with one block between them. They will be red. Um, perfect. We are now, and so on. But so then basically the, um, the builder starts building things and so on, right? Um, so really there's this, this sort of this interaction, this collaboration in this grounded context, right? Uh, between these two speakers. And of course, we're very, very far from being able to develop a systems that can actually understand or, or produce instructions like this, but we're working towards that. So it's sort of keep, keep, keeps going on. Right. So understanding language really means also being able to collaborate and communicate with each other. Right. So that's sort of dialogue. So my research goals, right? No. Basically, mean you know, I want to work on, build, on building systems that understand the possible to generate language. Right. And I and I have sort of worked on these different topics, and I'm going to go into each of these you know, sort of one by one now. So, so let's start with sort of parsing or grammar induction, right? So, so basically trying to get computers to, to parse sentences, right? So um, most of what we do um, in this area falls broadly under the umbrella of statistical parsing, which means that you assume you have some sort of a grammar right, which defines both the sentences of the language as well as their possible structures, so, so basically a set of trees. Um, and then you have some sort of a scoring function over these trees, right? say probability model that, that decides the score of these trees. Right? Um, and then you also need a parsing algorithm, right, which returns the best tree for each sentence. Right? And when I was working with Ken, right, we were actually basically using this paradigm, except we, were, we assumed that um, we had a grammar and a probability model, and the probability model was the energy function. We were looking at how we can use the parsing algorithm to basically understand how proteins fold, right? So basically, the other tree was the, um, the static structure um, of the protein, but it, but, but it basically captured the process by which proteins would fold. But that's a whole nother talk. Um, so, and most of the work in parsing falls under the umbrella of supervised learning, which means you've got labeled data. Um, in parsing, uh, those corpora, those data sets are called tree banks. Mm. Those basically give you both the grammar as well as the probability. It does work really well. Um, so um, there's different kinds of representations that people use. Um, for example, you know, you know, a standard model is basically context-free grammars, 
Um, so here's like um, a sentence, again, something that like fits on a slide, where each word is, um, has a tag which indicates whether it's a noun or a verb or an adjective, so on. Um, and then you try to basically recover sort of this bracketing of the sentence. We've got labels like noun phrase or IP, um, or verb phrase or sentence. Okay. Um, and, and then there's another way of looking at um, a syntactic structure. Um, it's called dependency grammar, where the idea is that you have, you basically want to introduce this, this, this graph, which typically is just a tree, um, over the words in a sentence. Right? So now you've got these directed edges between the words. And these are labeled right, with, say, subject and objects and modifier and so on. Right. And both of these representations work really well for supervised parsing. Um, I myself started out working on a different formalism called combinatory categorical grammar, or CCG, um, which also has trees, um, except that, they, that these, these labels look kind of funny. They've got all of these, these slashes and parentheses in there, so if you just sort of go like, whoa, what is that? Uh, you're not alone. It's just everybody's first reaction to this. Um, so, so let's look a bit you know, so, uh, more into what, what these actually mean, right? So basically, um, these flashes and so on basically tell you something about certain arguments right, that words expect. Um, and from that, you can actually also um, recover dependencies between words, right? So the blue end goes with the blue end, the, the red end goes with the red end, and so on. Right? Um, so CCG has a few atomic categories. But that, um, say things like like S for sentence, N for noun, and so on. Um, and then you've got these complex categories, which are basically all functions. Right? Um, so you've got a result, and you and then you've got a slash, right, which is either forward or backward um, that tells you basically where you, you know, whether your argument precedes you or follows you in the string. Um, and then you've got the argument. So let's go from a CFD tree to a CCG, right? So here we've got our standards, you know, S goes to NPVP, right? So in English, like a sentence consists of a noun phrase, like a subject, followed by a verb phrase, say, you know, a verb and an object. And if we go to CCG, that same um, uh, basically tree can be translated into, so we've got, no, the result, I should be um, an S, right? The whole thing is a sentence. And then, so, so the predicate or the function right, of a sentence we typically assume is the verb, right? So the argument should be the noun phrase, right? And of course, that argument comes before the verb phrase. So the category of the verb phrase should be S backslash N. And so these slashes, right? Um, yeah, I know they, they look sort of kind of funny at the, um, initially, but really you should just, th just think of these as, um, as fractions, right? You just multiply together these fractions, except that now you've got two kinds of flashes right, because it's not commutative, because you care about the order in which words appear in a sentence. Right? So y times x over y is not the same as x over y times y. Right? Right, so, um, but of course you could also you know, sort of have something like that, right? Um, right. um, you can compose these fractions, right? then you get sort of the, uh, the, these more complicated looking things. Uh, there's another operation called, called type raising, uh, which takes a while to get your head around. Um, and then you basically get these sort of complex syntactic trees, right? Um, and you can, you can basically do things that you can't really express in a context free grammar. For example, here in the sentence, you want, you want to express that, um, that that she bought the same candy that he ate, right? Again, the example is a bit silly, but you find these constructions in real text, it's just in order for things to fit on the slide, you've got to sort of you know, choose something appropriate, right? Um, right, so, so CCG, or categorical grammar, captures um, dependencies. If you're a linguist, it captures both local and non-local dependencies, and unlike certain other kinds of approaches, it doesn't need any traces or secondary edges. Um, and, and, and it has this you know, uh, fully transparent syntax semantics interface, which is nice um, linguistically. Again, um, and um, supervised parsers actually work really well. 
So, I, so my PhD was all of basically developing statistical puzzles for this for this framework. When I started out, people thought, oh god, CCG is just crazy, all of these flashes, that's that's completely impossible. And, um, and nowadays we have some CCG puzzles that are just exceptionally fast and work, work really, really well. Right. Um, so but it's all supervised puzzling, right? So, you, so, so you've got to have that feedback, you've got to have that label training data. Um, what happens when you don't have those labels, right? Where in this case, a label is actually a full, you know, sort of pulse tree, right? So uh, what happens when you just have raw text? Well, let's say raw text was part of speech text, right? So, so basically, after we got, we got all bored with the Wall Street Journal, because that was the main treatment that was available to us, we started thinking more again about unsupervised parsing, right? And we all started working on basically text that's annotated with these part of speech tags. Um, and the question is sort of, of course, where does the grammar come from? Where does the probability model come from? And you can't just sort of read off the trees and count how often each of them appears, right? Um, so um, uh, what happens when you, when you now, say, try to sort of learn it, um, something like the context-free grammar? Right? So if you remember, the supervised context-free grammar, you've got these categories like sentence and noun phrase and verb phrase, right? Which are sort of very clear linguistic interpretations. Okay. When you do this in an unsupervised fashion, right? It, but you might get the same bracketing, but you now get these arbitrary categories, right? But that really don't have any meaning, right? Uh, when you work with dependency grammars, right, you can also use these trees over, um, over the words in a sentence, right? But uh, they don't have any labels anymore. And right? so now you can't distinguish between subjects and objects and so on. Mm. So, so the sort of this question of like, what use are these unsupervised puzzles? Right? Um, what are you going to do with them? Right? So, these, so, the, so these structures basically, so the non-terminals are arbitrary. If you have unlabeled dependencies, you can't really interpret them. You don't know what they mean. Right? Um, and you can actually also show that this lack of explicit structure kind of complicates learning. Um, because <coughs> so, then, so then we started working on this, and of course we wanted to work on CCG-based grammar induction. And, uh, and it turns out that in CCG, because it has this really nice sort of mathematical foundation, right? Um, the, you know, but basically the categories are not just arbitrary symbols, but there's this clear sort of relation between functions and arguments and so on. You can actually exploit that in your probability model. I mean, you get a probability model that's much, much simpler right? than, say, what you need, need for a CFG. So how do you use a CCG? You've got some seed knowledge, right? You know that, like, say, verbs can, have, can be S, nouns can be N. And then you've got good a bunch of rules that basically they allow you to reduce these complex categories. Um, and so what this means is basically now we can look at a text. In this case, we started out with text that was part of speech tag. So we knew where the verbs and the nouns were, um, like everybody else who was working on this. Um, and we can now induce a linguistically motivated grammar, right, uh, without having labels, right? We can basically sort of try to enumerate all possible trees um, that the CCG can induce for more or less. Um, and now, okay, so when you look at the rules of CCG, so, so the particular association, so sort of different types of rules, yeah. so like function application, and then basically it's composition, which is like, like multiply the other two, two fractions. What you see is basically, if you know, say, the parent category, right? So basically, um, the result that you want to get when you combine two categories, as well as the particular kind of rule schema that you want to use, right? Right, then all you need to choose to know what the two children are, right, the, the left and the right node, is basically this one single category Y. Right? Right, so basically, you've got to sort of choose two things. You've got to choose a combinator, the rule, and then this category Y. And that makes for a very simple probability model. Turns out, you know, if you know some of those <coughs> probability models, it's basically as simple as, a, as, a, as an equivalent model for, for a finite state like HMM model even though C uh, CCGs are actually uh, very expressive. They're, they're more expressive than like context free grammars. Mm. We were able to show that these models work very well. Uh, they work better than like, say, uh, sort of state-of-the-art dependency-based approaches. Um, and what was really nice at the time was that, um, so um, there was sort of this notion in the field that um, uh, the, uh, these dependency-based models work really well on these short sentences, like up to 10 words, but then, you know, which is, which is nothing, right? But then once you go to longer sentences, their performance really degrades. 
Okay. And, and I mean, yeah, our performance did go down a little from 10 to 20 because, of course, you know, the number of trees is, you know, uh, uh, is, is basically this exponential function on the length of a sentence and so on, right? So it's huge. You know, so, um, so, of course, the search is much, much harder, right? Um, but our results didn't go down nearly as much on longer sentences. So we were very proud of that. Um, so, um, um, so yes, we can basically, uh, we have really good performance, uh, we work better on longer sentences, um, and then later we actually looked at uh, sort of recovery of like label dependencies, right, so basically, um, um, because, be, because we actually have uh, um, um, a label structure, right, we, we have a full CC2 derivation, so we can evaluate that. Um, and that allowed us to, to, to sort of look under the hood, to actually do an error analysis. And sort of the kinds of categories, right, that we just couldn't ever induce, right, that our model just, just wouldn't use, even though it was part of the search space, were things like possessive and, sub and subordinate conjunctions, adverbs, control verbs, and so on. So, um, so basically, we couldn't get the right category for like possessive S or for befores and before Monday or varies of the very tall man and so on. Right. So, so a whole bunch of sort of really sort of basic elementary things that we just couldn't get. Right. Um, so, and if you think about this linguistically, right, so unsupervised error induction basically breaks down exactly where you would expect it to break down. Right. So, so raw text just doesn't contain enough signal to identify and disambiguate all grammatical categories. But if you work with unlabeled dependencies, right, like most people, you would never know. Right? I mean, you really need, need sort of the right structure representation to be able to do this error analysis. Right? So, um, okay, so that was all about sort of, sort of syntactic analysis. Now let's go, go and switch sort of to, to the next problem, right, of, of describing <coughs> images. Right, so, um, you know, so there was a lot of hype about this a few years ago when there's now all of these you know, sort of commercial systems. Right, they could basically describe images, right? The caption images and so on. <coughs> um, right. um, so you can go home, right? This, this, it, it's a solved problem. I mean, and no, actually, no, it's not, not at all. Um, so I mean, actually, we started this work um, many years ago, um, and we really, you know, and at the time it was really sort of like, oh my god, um, this is sort of completely impossible. Right? You can't get a computer to like associate an image with like um, complete complete sentences, because you have so many words in your language, you need so many different detectors and so on for, you know, to be able to detect like a person and a, whatever, and a cat and a dog and like, you know, the gazillion different things that there are in the world, right? Um, so, okay, how do you get a computer to actually describe images? How do you work on like a new task like that, right? Um, where do, do these models break down? I'm gonna go into that a little bit. Um, how can we improve these models, right? I mean, like, how can we get sort of, sort of a deeper understanding of um, of images and language. Right. So, how do you get a computer to describe images? Well, you have to, to, to think about what task you want to use to basically develop and evaluate your systems, what model you want to use, and what data you want to use, right? In some sense, the data is sort of the first thing you need because otherwise you can't learn any models, right? Um, <coughs> so, what, so, and of course, that sort of begs the question of what kind of descriptions do you want to produce, right? So. So you probably, you know, the kind of description we're interested in was sort of very, very concrete, right? Um, right, so, and it's clear, you know, I mean, like, you know when the things are completely wrong, but of course, it's sort of this gray area, right? But, um, so evaluation is going to be difficult, right? Because it isn't just sort of a simple yes-no question in some sense, right? Um, we weren't really interested in, like, I don't know, specific, you know, say, say particular names or whatever, um, well, like, this was a game that was placed last Sunday, but we just wanted some, some generic description about what is shown in this image, right? Not something that somebody who knows what the image would, would sort of tell another person about it, right? So, what this, so we want to basically describe what's in the image, right? The entities, the events, the scenes, and only, but we only want to focus what's actually in the image, right? Um, so where do you get data from? So the problem is that basically, if you look at something like Flickr, right, you get millions of images, right, people describe these images, right, but the kind of information they associate with us, right, is just not, um, you know, 
at the level you know, you know, that we need. Right. And so people really don't provide conceptual descriptions because they write for other people who can see what's in the picture. Right. Why, why do you want to bother, right? So this is sort of a basic linguistic principle called Christian maxims, right? You want to be informative, you want to be relevant, right? So, um, so what that means is really if you want to get it, if you want to get it data right, that describes, um, that describes uh, these, these, these images, right, you've got to actually collect the data yourself. What is meaning? So, so we started uh, collecting data sets, right? We started out with, uh, with a small data set and we had like 8,000 images, harvested from Flickr and then 30,000 images. Uh, but we just basically crowdsourced the description. And we ended up with, with five descriptions per image. Right. Um, and now that we have this data, we can think about different uh, uh, image description tasks. Right? And that's, you know, so broadly speaking, there's sort of two ways you can think about this. One is, you know, sort of ultimately the application that, that we're all interested in, which is basically, um, you take an image and then the computer generates a sentence. Okay. Um, so, of course, that sort of, sort of begs the question of what should you say about an image, right? How do we produce a grammatical sentence, right? How do we evaluate these generated descriptions, right? um, We have some automated metrics, none of them work well. Um, you really need, need human evaluation for this, which is very expensive and which you basically can't, uh, can't, can't really train your systems on, right? Um, the other, the other uh, task that, that you can look at is you can say, okay, I've got a pool of images I've never seen before, a pool of sentences I've never be, seen before. Can I now basically rank uh, my sentences for, 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 for each of these images? Okay. Um, and then in that case, the evaluation is actually straightforward because one caption in the pool was written for the image, right? right. At least, you know, you know, there might be other, other sentences that are also decent descriptions or close enough descriptions. You, it's really hard to get at that because you can't annotate the full matrix, you know. But, but at least you get sort of some some approximation, and, and um, you get some metric that you can compare any system against. Um, and of course, you can also do the converse problem, right? You can basically, you know, say now I want to search for an image by say typing into Google some sentence that describes the scene that I'm interested in. Okay. Um, what kind of models do you want to use? Um, so there's different kinds of models. You basically have to have some sort of an affinity function that maps how 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 well an image and a sentence go together, right? You can you, you can think of this as a probability. Um, for example, you want to generate s condition on i, or perhaps as a similarity or distance, right? Uh, where you where you try to sort of compute how similar an image is to a sentence. And that's typically done by mapping i and s to some common vector space. <coughs> Um, and then basically you can, you can find the closest sentence for each image in that space. Um, and, and perhaps you want to use some sort of explicit representation of what's in the image on the sentence or not, right? Uh, right. Um, so for like generation-based image description, you know, people you know, initially started, so, so this work was all started, actually a lot of this work was done here at Stony Brook, right? Um, by people, you know, basically who would use traditional LOD techniques, right? You would use templates, you use grammars, right? It's very explicit detectors, right? Um, nowadays, we've all switched to neural nets, so, so we use, say, for example, something like a recurrent net with deep learning based image features and so on, right? And that turns out to actually work much better than because, because it generalizes much better. But, um, how do you map images and sentences to, to a vector space? So there's sort of different approaches that you could use, right? Basically, the idea is that you want to learn a function from images to vectors and from sentences to vectors such that the vectors of images and sentences that go together are, are close together in the space. Okay. Um, we, had, we had a paper on that where we used something called, called, called KCCA. Um, we applied that to basically image uh, retrieval and the um, an image description, right, in this ranking uh, paradigm. Here are some examples from that paper at the time. Um, so, so this was done basically without any detectors, with uh, no neural nets, just sort of very low level basic vision features, right? I mean, like nowadays you can do much, much better than this. It's just these, these are the slides that I had around. 
Um, I love the last example about the basketball players in action. <laughs> and about the child jumping on a tennis court. Um, I mean, you know, people really, really didn't believe us that this was possible without detectives, right? Okay. So, um, but do these models actually understand the images or language, right? Well, why do these models work so well, perhaps as poorly as they do? Right? Where do they break down, right? So can we construct some task right, that allow us to analyze the behavior of these sort of off-the-shelf image description models? Right? I mean, like, like, you know, after our work and the work that here at Stony Brook, right, suddenly there was this huge sort of commercial interest in this problem. Right? Um, and basically, Google and Facebook and Microsoft and everybody got sort of on the bandwagon and worked on this uh, to the point where, like, as, an, as an academic, you just couldn't compete anymore. <laughs> okay. um, so, so we have a paper where we essentially look at um, how can we evaluate these models. And we, you know, sort of perhaps uh, in a slightly different way. Right? So we looked at so-called binary forced choice tasks. Right? So the idea is that, um, yeah, Give the system, right? I mean, like any model, right, has to have some sort of a scoring function, right? And it doesn't matter whether it's a generation-based model or a ranking-based model. You have to be able to assign a score to how well an image goes together with a sentence, right? So, um, give the um, the model one image and two sentences, right? And ask the model to pick the right one, right? And then just evaluate how often it gets the right one. So you've got a goal and a distractor, um, and then you can just basically measure the accuracy, right? And so we basically designed this whole battery of different tasks where the distractor, you know, sort of varied systematically from the goal in a certain way. Right? And that basically allowed us to, to focus the evaluation on specific aspects of the image description. Right? So for example, the replace person task might be just basically replace the subject with some other random subject from, from a data set. And so this was kind of, um, then of course, a made up sentence that, that you know, wouldn't normally occur. Right? Um, we, we could do the same thing basically with scene words. Right? Um, right? And um, again, we had, we had a whole bunch of items there. And what kind of results did we get? So um, we're going to look basically at four models. Our baseline in blue is, is a text-only bigram language model. Right? So that's a model that just basically computes the probability of a sentence by computing the probability of each word given the preceding word, and then it's multiplied to those probabilities. Right? And then we have, we have three other models, right? one that uses generation, you know, uh, one that uses ranking, and, well, another one that uses ranking. So LSTM is basically this, this kind of recurrent neural net right, that actually models the sequence. Uh, the bag of word model uh, uh, basically doesn't care about the sequence um, um, of words in a sentence. Okay? So, um, but, but all of these, these last three models are trained on the image uh, text data, but the blue one only looks at, at the text. But here are the results we get. Right? So basically, the Bible line, no, I mean like the, the Bible model works just as well as the LSTM ranking model, right? The other models work a little bit better, but it's sort of surprising, right? Um, how, how well these models work. When you replace the scene, right, uh, then suddenly um, the other models that actually train on the image <coughs> work much better. Uh, of course, trans here is 50%. Um, so this sort of seems to imply that models seem to pick up on these seed fit. Uh, features, right? Sort of, sort of global properties of the image. Right? Um, so I've got a person task, language model is hard to beat, but in a scene task, language model is really easy to beat. Right? Um, but it's so, so, sort of really weird is that sort of among these ranking models, right? So the bag of word models actually seems to outperform the the, um, the LSTM. Then we took another task. Uh, so now we looked at all sentences where basically we have two people. And the distractor, we basically just swap the, uh, the subject and the object, <laughs> right? So, so um, we only had about 300 items because there's not that many sentences like that in the data, but still, you know. So, so how do the results look like? Um, here's what we got. You see that actually the best model is the Bihara model. It doesn't even look at the image. <coughs> right. 
right? So um, and the other and the uh, the ranking model is basically perform a chance. But the Bible words model, you would expect to perform a chance because because here we really care about the word order, right? So the, so so the fact that the red bar is just exactly fifty percent, that's what you would expect. The fact that the that the LSTM ranking model isn't much better than that, that's that's kind of bad, right? Um, okay, but but the fact that uh, even the uh, I don't know, that basically none of the neural models that look at the image are any better than the text only bigram model, right? which doesn't use any smoothing, doesn't use anything, right? It's really simple, um, is sort of very depressing, um, right? So are we done? Is the description no, right? Right. So, so on the one hand, right, I mean, like based on all these commercial applications, right, learning to associate images right, with simple sentences that describe them seems to be a much easier task than what we thought perhaps 10 years ago. Right. Um, but it doesn't mean that these models actually understand what they're doing. Right? I really think we're fooling ourselves if we think that it means we understand that. Right? So, you might, so, you, so you might have heard of this, this really old chatbot called Eliza. Right? But for the 1960s or whatever, right? Which was basically this computer therapist, right? But it was just done by sort of, sort of simple templates, you know. Um, but there was no learning, there no understanding, right? And people would like really open themselves up to this thing because they thought, oh, finally somebody understands what I'm, what I'm saying, right? Because the main strategy was just to ask more. So tell me more about your whatever you just said in the previous sentence, right? So this is known as the Eliza effect, right? That people basically really sort of get fooled by this. And I really think that this is what's going on. Right. These systems don't really understand. They just right. so so these so these current evaluation metrics might hide real weaknesses of these models, and I think it's going to matter as we move sort of sort of to more complex tasks, right? You know, so for example, you know, so um, so 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 a few years ago, we, we basically augmented our image data set with with entity information, right? Where we um we basically added um. Bounding boxes for all of the entities, <coughs> and we annotated the entities across the sentences and so on. Right. So, but so now basically the task is: so you want to identify which you know sort of you've got a woman, now a woman pushes a child on a swing while another child looks on. Right. So now of course if you really understand the sentence, right, you should be able to know which child is which. Right. And I mean like, at least our system at the time really didn't do this. Right. It, but it really sort of got the wrong child. Right. So actually, you know, sort of trying to understand this, trying to make sure you get the right entities ground, right? That's that's a much harder task. Right. So we're still working on that. Right. So here we've got we've got the mapping. Right. So back to language understanding. Um, so this model that, that, that we used, right? At KCCA, or like any kind of vector-based model that just basically assumes we've got the similarity between, say, sentences and images, basically assumes this sort of this one-to-one -one mapping, right, between the between <coughs> images and images, right? But that's really not how our language works, right? So if you think, so, so there's this notion that comes from, uh, essentially, formal semantics. Uh, it's been around for, I don't know, since the 19th century, right? That's, so, so the idea is that, well, what is a declarative sentence? Like the kind of sentences we have in these image description data, Right. It describes a set of situations, right, or a set of possible worlds. Right? So a mad pet's a stingray. That's going to be a particular set of situations, and that a child plays is going to be a particular set of situations, and a girl plays on the beach is going to be another set of situations, right? Um, and if you look at, at sentences like like a girl plays on the beach right, versus a child plays, there's a clear sort of subset relation there. Which is something you you just can't capture with the sort of simple one-to-one -one mapping, idea. right? It's just it's just not not the way you could express, right? So the, so so these sets of sort of possible situations or possible worlds, they're called denotations. Um, they use these sort of funny double angle brackets to, to refer to these sets. Um, and well, I mean that's a lovely you know sort of theoretical notion, but it's sort of a little bit unclear what to do with this in practice. Right, so what you could do is basically you could, you know, you would translate sentences, say, um, to, to some practical logic, and perhaps you would want to build them all, or perhaps just sort of stick with these logical formulas, right? Um, 
But what we can do now, right, because we actually have, have a whole bunch of sentences, like, like around 150,000 sentences, that are associated with images, right? right? We, can, we can actually instantiate this idea and make it concrete and empirical by saying, well, each image corresponds to a possible world, right? Um, and so, so um, and then, well, once we have that, okay, so, um, so these annotations, right, really define a subsumption hierarchy or lattice over these image descriptions, right? right? So a girl plays on the beach is a subset of all the images described by a child plays. Right? And basically, you can build this hierarchy automatically for mock corpus of image captions, right? And it sort of looks like this, right? So this is like a toy novel, right? So you have like, you know, so you, so, so you start at the bottom with these sort of very concrete descriptions that typically only apply to a single image, and then you sort of make these sentences more and more generic, um, um, and then you basically end up with, say, like, a girl plays, you know, describing a lot more images than, the, than, like, a girl plays on the playground and so on, until you go up to, like, say, like, a child plays or a child or playing and so on. Right? And so we constructed this graph automatically from what I just said. Um, and now, we can basically compute the similarity of descriptions in terms of the similarity of the annotations. And we can do this basically probabilistically, so we can compute, for example, conditional probabilities um, or, or point by mutual information. So now we can basically just sort of read off the similarities um, from the data, or what I'm going to show you in a bit is basically we can learn a model that, that basically can predict these similarities for, for previously unseen sentences. Here are some examples, right? So these are, so these are conditional probabilities. And so the model knows that if you're engaging in a conversation, you're probably talking, if you're swinging your racket, you're probably playing tennis. If you're waiting for a subway, um, you, uh, you might be standing. If you're riding a subway, you might be sitting, and so on. Right? If you're looking in a mirror, you might be shaving. If you're using a shovel, you might be digging a hole. If you stick on your tongue, you're probably making a face. And so, the, so these are all you know, sort of things that we can learn from our data. Right? And that's because we have multiple independently generated descriptions for each image. Right? Yeah? So these are actual probabilities learned from your system? This or, is just for, uh, just for an illustration. So this is just read off from the data. This is just read off from the data. This is just what's in the data set. Um, I will later show you a model that can basically predict these, these probabilities. Right? right so, so actually, these models capture a lot of world knowledge, a lot of sort of common sense knowledge. Right? You can also look at point mass mutual information, which is more of a symmetric um, measure, right? So you can see that, like, the like opening compression and, and unwrapping is, you know, are really close. Lassoing and trying to rope is really close. Getting ready to kick and running towards the wall. Is All of these things are really close, right? Um, right, so our hypothesis was that the notational similarity would be particularly useful for tasks that require this kind of inference. And we, and we showed, uh, the time that basically our um, this is true. We, we we want a particular kind of textual Talmud task um, that requires this kind of knowledge. Uh, I'll get more to Talmud in a minute. What is Talmud? Right. So the idea is you've got a premise sentence, and then you've got a hypothesis that may be entailed by the sentence, um, or might be contradicted by the sentence, or perhaps it's neutral. So, so, so the task is basically, given these two sentences, you want to identify which of these three relations hold. And so this is really a task that tries to get that sort of, sort of the reasoning capabilities, right? That, that also play, a, play an important part in language understanding, right? And so, of course, you could map this basically to these conditional probabilities, right? So the probability of the hypothesis given the premise is zero, should be a contradiction. If it's one, it's got, it should be in Hellman. And perhaps if it's 0.5, it should be neutral. And so on. Right? So there's sort of a clear connection between this task and sort of this probabilistic, you know, you know these, these conditional probabilities. Right. Okay. So um, how can we actually sort of get to sort of learning these probabilities, right? I mean, ultimately, we'd like to be able to sort of predict these probabilities. And so um, uh, you can think about words that sort of lie in some vector space, right? And then you can sort of compute the similarity in terms of the similarity of vectors, right? 
right? that, that kind of suffers from the same sort of, you know, sort of problem that you can't really capture, um, you know, that one word might be um, a more generic version than an, um, of another word, right? that's what I said. So let's say animal and dog would both be points in the space. Um, what we really want to capture basically is these denotational similarities. Um, so there was a paper in 2015 that, that basically um, captured what are called order embeddings, right? Where they really tried to sort of capture that like, like uh, woman and person and object. Yeah. So like woman is more specific than person, is more specific than object, and so on. Um, so, so we looked at that model and we thought, oh, actually we can use sort of a variant of this model to directly predict um, these probabilities because it turns out when you look at the space, you could basically sort of no, turn it into probabilities, right? Um, so just by saying basically the size of this region corresponds to, so, so basically each, each point defines a region in the space and the, uh, the size of that region corresponds to its probability mass. Um, so if you can, so, so basically if you can map, um, uh, say a sentence to a vector, but you can then basically predict its probability. And, and, if, and you can also look at conditional probabilities, right, because, because I mean, like, essentially, um, to get the conditional probability, you just need to know the joint, you know, probability. Um, so, um, but again, the details don't matter too much, but, but the idea was basically that now we can predict the notational probabilities if we can predict the corresponding vector. This model mathematically isn't quite right. There was a, you know, there's some obvious shortcomings. Uh, I know Rick Hallam had a paper later on that, that, that corrected some of these. Um, right. um, but um, so, so, so look, that's the basic idea, right? Now, the idea is we want to, to predict these vectors that give us the right probabilities. And we can learn these vectors through neural net. Okay, and I won't, I'm gonna display the details. Um, how well do we do? Well, you can look sort of at the calibers, of distributions, business R, right? This works quite well. Of course, it works worse when, when both X and Y didn't appear um, in the training data, right? But it still works you know, sort of reasonably well, right? Um, so, so this model works well for these sort of short pairs of short phrases because that's what we have in our graph. Um, what about longer sentences that we actually care about for textual entailment, right? So, um, well, if you just apply this model, it doesn't really work very well because, so these are the distributions of probabilities, right? There's basically, you know, basically everything has low probability. You can't really separate the contradictions from the neutral from the entailments, as in the slide that I showed you earlier, right? Where you, where you would like the contradictions to have really low probability, the neutrals to be somewhere in the middle, and the entailments to have really high probability. So we added basically examples from this data set and we just made up the probabilities in like the simplest possible way. Um, you can probably do better. Um, but, but basically once you do that um, and you add this, these sentences uh, to our data, then you get a, you know, a much better fit. Um, and then uh, here's sort of some examples of what our model predicts. Um, right, so, so here's a neutral example where we predict the probability of 0.3. Here's another neutral example, we pick 0.86, right? Um, right, so, so we do, you know, so, so, so we're able to show that basically by incorporating these denotational models, we got a little bit of an improvement, <coughs> right? right? So they help with entailment, but, but of course what we also realize in the process is that, I mean, like, I still really like sort of conceptually this idea of denotational similarities, but in practice, I mean, the problem is really we only have like 30,000 images or so. We don't have enough, enough images to really sort of estimate this problem as robustly. And of course, we really don't know how to apply this approach to like, say, abstract types of information, right? Because this is all just sort of image description. It's very concrete. But still, I still sort of, sort of really like this work, um, at least sort of conceptually. Um, and then, so the last couple of years, I've worked on this, basically, um, on dialogue. On this ground of dialogue, and we were, and we started to work on on Minecraft, right? So, so I'm sure you all know Minecraft, and right? this game where you can basically place blocks, you can navigate, and so on. Um, right. So here's sort of some example. Um, we, you know, because we're really interested in in basically natural language uh, communication, we developed, we sort of sort of designed this task we call the collaborative building task, right? Which is basically what I showed you earlier. 
So you've got this architect with this shown this target structure, um, and the architect can also observe what, what, the, what the other player, the builder, is doing. And then, basically, they can chat back and forth about, you know, um, while the builder is trying to basically build whatever the architect is telling him to build. Right. right. So, so the architect instructs, um, instructs the builder to build a given target structure of colored blocks. The rules are that, that only A knows the target structure, only B can place blocks. A and B communicate by a chat, and A can observe these actions. So if you're familiar with something like the map task, which is sort of an, you know, sort of an old you know, sort of data set and dialogue, it's, a very, it's sort of a very similar kind of setup, right, where you've got sort of asymmetric information. So here's an example of what the architect sees, what the target, um, and here's basically what the builder is doing. right? So this is screenshots from like um, an actual human-human human game. Right? Um, but here's sort of the builder's view as they're, as they're building something. Right. And um, our data set might consist of basically around 500 dialogues for, between people for, for around 150 different structures. Um, here's the target configuration. And again, here's sort of this dialogue that I showed you at the beginning of the talk. Um, there's a lot of referring expressions that, you know, sort of how, how, how do you refer to something? There's a lot of people actually make up names for these shapes, right? Oh, this looks like an L, a silly multicolored worm. So I'm going to refer to this shape as our windows from here on. Of course, we have no hope at the moment of our systems ever being able to sort of produce these things on the fly for things they've never seen before. Right? It's just completely, uh, I think, um, out of scope. Right? So what we started doing is basically we tried to create an architect for this. Right? And um, so, so the task is basically the architect needs to create clear and correct instructions in this sort of constantly changing environment. Right? So the architect needs to identify the next steps for the builder. It needs to, you know, in order to know what these are, it needs to be able to align this, this target with whatever the builder happens to be doing. And it needs to adapt to sort of the current position to know, say, where left and right are, for example. And it needs to be able to interrupt and correct the builder. And it should really, really respond in real time. It needs to identify mistakes. It needs to be able to answer any question that the builder poses. Right? Uh, our systems are very far from being able to do this. Right? What we focused on is uh, what we call the utterance generation task, where the idea was that now let's just first start by saying we're in a particular human human dialogue at a particular point in time. Can we mimic what, you know, can we predict what a human would say in that particular situation? which right. is very different from having a fully interactive architect agent. Right. So there's no real-time aspect, there's no overall task completion, right? how you maintain a whole conversation, right? you just train the system for one at a time. Um, we used the neural, you know, we used the neural networks, we had sort of an encoder-decoder framework where we encode both the dialogue history and the world state. Um, so um, the challenge is basically that, um, how do you model the world state? Well, well, you need to basically be able to compare um, the target with the build configuration. And we did something very simple, right? And, um, we basically just sort of have a representation of sort of counters. And so we try to sort of align the two structures. We try to estimate how many red blocks are missing, how many yellow blocks are missing, how many, how many blocks need to be removed, right? Because, um, because very often the builder makes mistakes, right? So, so we estimate these, these numbers, right, and probabilistically because we don't actually know the right one <coughs> necessarily. Um, right. um, and here are just sort of some examples. Right. So here the bullet just placed the top left blue block, and then the architect says, and then the blue block to the left of that part. Right. Right. So the color of the next block is correct, but the spatial relation is wrong. And here's another example. Wait, so here, now the architect says, perfect, now place the red block to the left of that. Where it where the color and the spatial relation are both correct. Right. Right. Um, but it's really difficult, of course, for, for, for this model to do much beyond just sort of saying where, where to place the next block. Right. It's just sort of, you know, so, um, but, so um, we did some human evaluation, right? How correct are these utterances with respect to the current game set and the target? Because, of course, co car, um, correct utterances are much more likely to lead to actual task completion 
right? And what we found was that, um, so this basic C2C model, it has no access to like the world state, I don't know, um, performed much worse than like our block counter model. Um, right, but so, um, so the, so this block counter model really has significantly more fully or partially correct utterances by 25% fully correct, 36% partially correct utterances. But of course, this is still very, very far from actually having solved this task. Right? There's still a lot more that it can be done. And my group is working on like more complex models for this task. We're also working on trying to build a builder for this task. Um, right. So um, I'm almost um, over time, so just sort of to, to, to conclude, where are we at? Right, are computers actually closer to understanding language? Yeah, in a way, right? I mean, like, the question is always, you know, um, we do need some supervision. Where does that come from? Right, annotation is expensive. What's the right representation? Right, image description really went from basically a total fringe topic to real world commercial applications just within a few years, right? And it was really mind blowing. But I really think that it, that there's a bit of an Eliza effect going on. Right. But these denotational similarities, I really think that they get at some sort of a common sense knowledge of these sort of everyday situations, right? what you can describe in an image. But of course, there's lots of, you know, it's difficult to get enough data even just for that domain of images. And it's a little bit unclear how to apply this to other kinds of, you know, sort of knowledge. Yeah. Um, and grounded dialogue, I think, is still sort of largely unsolved. Right? This is still a very, very difficult task. It's very exciting, but there's lots of work that remains to be done. Right. So, thanks. Questions? No. So in your block world, um, Terry went and grabbed the office, right? So um, <laughs> yes. uh, what I'm wondering about is you're trying to figure out what this system should say. Yeah. Um, it's like a human trait. But really what the people are doing in that multimodal dialogue is when you do something, if you're the builder, and you put the block there, that's your turn in the conversation. Yeah. And so they're grounding with each other. Well yes, grounding in the world. And yes. So, um, are you? Um, so there's this notion that you need to have that there are two minds coordinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And right. so, how do you capture that? So, I will provide an utterance if, as the builder if I don't get the kind of response I'm expecting from yeah. my partner. But otherwise, I'm assuming my turn is putting the block on top of it. So we've collected data. About yeah, this, yeah. So people really don't produce verbalizations unless they're trying to initiate clarification of dialogue. So, so it's right. based on hypothesis testing of the two agents. So right. how, would you, how would a system that wants to learn to have common sense and wants to learn to be conversational represent this sort of coordination structure that's going on where I can't assume that you've understand, understood my phrase, even if yeah. it's simple, until I get the evidence back to you? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's hard. I mean, like, we look at sort of simple timing, right? And, it, and you know, because of course we want to make that kind of actually interactive, right? And so, so we think that basically, if you just let the architect wait for like I don't know ten seconds, you know, kind of, kind of nothing happened, and you then sort of chime in, that that sort of covers most of the, you know, sort of timing in this human human conversation. But you're not but, timing, but at, using timing yet, right? At the moment, but this is not fully interactive. Okay. It's not fully interactive. We have this thing plugged into the interactive microbiome and performs terribly, <laughs> right? But just because. Because what? Because once you're in like a conversation with an agent, right? I mean, the dialogue history is so different from like what it's trained on, right? It's just really bad. Right? Um, so we're trying to also make these models more robust, right? You can't quite use reinforcement learning, but there might be something like collaborative reinforcement learning or something. We're not sure yet. Um, we first have to have a builder up and running before we can start thinking about these problems, right? Um, so, um, so, we, so we're currently sort of working on that, but I. We also we have some dialogue act annotations, right? So we have some dialogue acts for the architect as well as for the for the builder. And I mean, like the next thing is of course that a lot, you know. So so like when the builder asks a question, right? I mean, like you know that you need to uh, to answer it immediately, right? Whereas when they go off and like do something, right? I mean, like you might need to interrupt them, right? But but I mean, like as soon as you realize that they're making a mistake, you should probably say, hey, stop! This is wrong. Right? And because we can sort of align these structures, right? We can sort of detect these errors early on. Um, so, but it, but you know, so, um, yeah, that's basically what, what we're trying to do, right? I mean, like the builder, so for the so so for the builder, right? The challenge is basically to you know, um, knowing when to speak rather than than the, than the, 
then, then we're to place blocks, right? right? So, we try, so, we're, so we're not quite there yet. Uh, we have an idea for our model, right? But we can actually predict the next block actions. When we know that the next block was placed or removed, we can, we can predict that without a language input, like 68% accuracy or something, which is really surprising. I don't know, I don't know how well, you know, you know, why we're getting such high numbers, because you've got about 1,000 locations in this grid, and about, you know, basically seven possible actions. So about 7,000 possible actions, and, and we still, you know, get 68% accuracy. I don't know how that's possible, but uh, I have to trust my student. Um, <laughs> there's probably just sort of a lot of things that are sort of very predictable about, about you know, you just sort of keep, keep placing the same block on top of whatever you just placed. That probably captures a lot of situations. Right. Um, so, yeah, we'll, I mean, like, we'll see. I think there's, the, you know, you know, there's a lot of really interesting questions. And of course, we only have 500 dollars, which is not much. Yeah. Yeah, so I was really struck by the um, work you presented in, in the middle of the talk where you have, we're switching the subject to an object and right. we get a simple biogram model and so on. And, you know, a few years ago, Jeff Hinton, you know, one of these neural network, uh, you know, leaders had, had said that he believed that within five years, uh, you'd be able to feed a video, like a five minute video into a neural network and you would output a textual summary of what right. happened in the course of the video. And so when I look at your results and I hear about this sort of, which I'm very skeptical of this prediction, but I know yeah. other, there are many other people who aren't skeptical of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I mean, I, I wonder to what extent are, are other researchers who are, look, who are working at the vision and text summary kind of interface, are they uh, doing those kinds of tests that you were doing, which are, I think, different from a lot of standard testing examples. Yeah, right? yeah, Lots yeah. Lots of testing examples are just checking to see do I have something, like you said, close to whatever my supervised example was? Yeah. But here you're actually manipulating the data systematically in a way to, to see if the results are, are what they ought to be. Right. And in the sense, it's sort of unnatural data in that way, or they're unnatural test examples in some sense because they've been these, they're systematically uh, constructed. I think they're a great example because it sort of illustrates the weakness of the system yeah, and yeah. improve yeah. and so on. But there's a sense in which they're not sort of just Collected from a corpus, and then you're yeah, yeah, yeah. That. It's a very different way of doing evaluation. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. So, so I just want to hear your, your thoughts on that. On um, you know, I think we need to do more of that type of work. Right. Like more, more, more sort of probing, or basically, you know, you know, where these systems break down, and yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so do you think like? I mean, also, of course, these. So, so we did these experiments a few years ago, right? And I think possible that nowadays, and like you know, whatever work and so on, you would get better results, right? But it's. I would expect to get better results, but you know, but it, uh, but, well, but know still, but I don't know whether this is solved, right? Because I haven't tried. I haven't, you know, I have, you know. Yeah. Could you tell me how this is related to the problem of protein folding? Okay. Okay. So. Um, okay. Well, Let's I see. Can, yeah. In a nutshell. A sentence is a series of words, and um, as Julia showed, there's links that relate those words. In protein fold, a protein is a series of amino acids. It's a, sing it's a string also. And what we're looking to uh, compute, ultimately, given the string of amino acids, is what are the link linkages that represent the folded state of the protein. And it turns out the answer that Julia found was that local first and global later. If you make local links that make sense, and you make other local links that make sense in a sentence that are phrases, then I can interpret a sentence that way. And the same thing happens in the protein. Proteins fold very fast, and they do this apparently by a very fast local search and then a port. So, well, I think my question was sort of, yeah. Is the no, I mean, like, simply to uh, collect all the sequences that are available in the database? And uh, break them down maybe in uh, peptapeptide or pentapeptide sequences and find out how often they occur. And then, uh, depending on the frequency of the actual occurrence in the database, uh, predict the uh, conformation of a protein that hadn't been uh, analyzed by crystallography, say, yeah. up to that yeah. point. I mean, I would then understand that all you have to do in order to understand language or mimic language is to look at uh, all the entire database of literature or recorded dialogues, etc., and uh, and put together a 
an understanding of the language. As, uh, I understand that a three-year-old has learned uh, to speak his native language after having, having listened to 30 million words in a three-year period. So it should be very easy to, uh, to speak a language, I mean, for the robot, of course, after hearing, say, 30 billion words or contexts. And uh, anyway, my, I've been interested in finding out how this can be applied to uh, machine translation. And uh, I remember a couple of years ago when I tried to translate uh, from English to German, I got uh, a horrible uh, German text. The last time I tried it, the, the Google Translate program produced a flawless uh, German text, and I was really impressed. So how did they do it? That they do it the, the way I... That's new lens. That's deep. The, that's... So, so the way we're doing machine translation, but, but, you know, I mean, for the last 15 years, we have been basically you know, sort of training models based on, on corpora of parallel data, you know, sort of say German text from to English and vice versa, to, um, to train, you know, to, to basically learn a model that can, that can automatically translate, right? Um, you know, but nowadays we use these neural models that work much, much better than like, like the more sort of symbolic based you know, sort of statistical machine learning mo models that we used before, right? But in those models, you know, especially these sort of recurrent nets and so on, right? They're, they're amazingly effective. It's it's a real game changer. Right? I mean, you see it especially for a language like German, right? Which is which isn't like like English, right? I mean, the word order really is sort of very complicated, and yeah, yeah. And now all of a sudden we can do it, right? And it's a little bit unclear. I mean, like, you know, how do you look under the hood? How do you know why these models work so well? Right? I mean, like, part, partly it's just because we happen to have so much data for for these language pairs. That's that's super helpful. But that's not quite enough, right? There has to be some level of, you know, some sort of, sort of generalization in the models. Really, uh, that's really amazing. So one more little nutshell there is that um, for proteins, it's been a huge enterprise for 40 years of people looking at these sequences and making those comparisons. And at the end of the day, what happens is you can often predict a native structure of a protein. What we were looking to do was to find the sequence of events that led up to it. And that problem is there's no database that can tell you that sort of thing. Um, the caveat to all of this is that even after you make these whopping databases of protein sequences and protein structures, um, the answer is it still levels off at some um, success levels for prediction that are not anywhere near good enough to do anything like drug discovery. So you need more mechanistics involved somehow. So what, what is this uh, level on a digital plateau? It depends a lot on what you're willing to assume. There's a whole lot of ways of, of answering that question. Any more questions for Julia? Comments? Um, well, I just wanted to add for the machine translation, they still make mistakes, which are very similar to what you pointed out with the pictures and how you, if you switch things around, so it sounded like you speak German, so you can just go to your computer right now and have it translate from German to English. One case is the Hans Fried Sein Hund, the other one is the Hans Fried Sein Hund. So for anybody who doesn't speak German, it might sound like I said exactly the same thing twice, but this yeah. means completely different things. In one yeah. case, um, John is missing his dog, in the other case, John's dog is missing John. So, and they still get that wrong. So they're going to translate both sentences as the same thing in English, because they're basically just interpreting all the possible cases of the dog missing the owner of the other way around. They don't pay attention to many things. Well, I know when you use voice typing, you can uh, dictate in a number of languages. Yes. I did that in German, and it still makes mistakes. I mean, the opposite. Yes, yeah. Open, yeah. And it hasn't been perfected yet. Yeah. Yeah. But it is amazing that you now have these commercial applications that are just everywhere. Right? They're so, so, sort of in our pockets. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, like, it's really incredible like, how much we yeah. get. So, is yes, there a difference between spoken and digital languages when it comes to understanding? I mean, yeah, to, so, I, so, I, so, to, so the two research communities, I mean, like, they have a lot in common, right? But, it's, but I mean, like, to do spoken language, you need a lot of signal processing, for example, right? That basically, I, I know how the anything about. 
I haven't looked at that since I was an undergrad, so yeah. Okay, let's thank Julia again.